The Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Coming to Kickstarter from the mind of Franco, the man behind Teen Titans Go to the Library, Faye of the Moon, and All Yeah Comics, comes the new LXT, the adversarial fighting card game, live now on Kickstarter. LXT, Lux vs. Tenebris. Imagine a loved one has been spirited away to a land of terror and torture. Would you be willing to go after them and fight through a horde of acolytes of the Dark One just to get them back? Developed as a role-playing card game that can be played multiple ways. The cards will have full-color illustrations on the front and chock-full of stamps and moves on the back. You can also get the LXT Who's Who book with origin stories and information about all the characters. Still want more? Also available is the LXT Dark Atlas book, filled with pro stories about all the baddies and illustrations from a wide selection of comic artists. There are plenty of add-ons you can purchase separately like comic books, stickers, original art from the game, and more. It's going to be a howling good time. LXT, live, now on Kickstarter. Welcome back, everybody. It's time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here, really happy to uh, welcome back Matt Clickstein and Scott Shaw, exclamation point, uh, back to Word Balloon. Uh, good to see you guys. Uh, I'm excited about our subject today, uh, the history of Comic-Con. And uh, you both were involved with the uh, the podcast and also the Fanographics book that uh, Matt put together, See You in San Diego. And uh, I guess you have big news uh, for us regarding your history of Comic-Con project. Yeah, thanks uh, for having us on, John. And uh, thanks, Scott, for always for joining us and being so supportive through this whole process. Uh, for anyone who has the book, they'll, they see, uh, I mentioned this in the back of the book where I kind of do some acknowledgments and whatnot, uh, that, that uh, one of the great uh, pleasures of this whole project of working on the history of Comic-Con, be it the podcast Comic-Con Begins or the book see at san diego has become as the fact that i was able to become really good friends with a lot of these folks the subjects of the story and certainly scott shaw is one of those people um a he's literally one of the co-founders or co-originators whatever word we're using today uh of comic con uh and uh, you know it's been there since day one since day zero since day negative one uh and um we've, we've really become very close over the last couple of years uh and that's been one of the great joys of this project and why I also have stayed so steadfast about it through a lot of challenges, the very beginning would be COVID and then the lockdown and all the craziness of 2020 and 2021. And, and then just everything else that we've had to go through since then uh, to get to this point. And uh, yeah, we're very excited to announce uh, that we are moving forward with the documentary about Comic-Con. Uh, it's something that we've been trying to develop and work toward uh, also kind of since day one. But again, it's just been a lot of obstacles and challenges. Uh, but we are here now and uh, we are able to announce that we're working with a really great filmmaking team uh, that's partnered with us. Uh, and we have a lot of folks involved in doing this. And uh, before we move on, uh, you know, the, the biggest thing of all is that we've uncovered uh, 15 hours of video archives from a private archive that's been just kind of sitting there and waiting for us to come. It's actually such old, uh, obscure video format. We had to spend quite a lot of money, and this is thanks to the production team we're working with and having it transferred, and that was very challenging as well. But we have some amazing, amazing material, stuff that nobody has seen in years, not since the actual events themselves, going all the way back to the 1970s. And that's really what's kind of kick-started this whole entire aspect of the story where we can finally do 
the documentary. Sort of the missing piece was, well, where's the video archive stuff? And now we finally actually have it. So we're really excited about that. When you were uh, making Comic-Con Begins, the podcast, were you doing video interviews along with uh, the audio? Or as you said, it was during COVID. So maybe that was a challenge and it was easier just to get pure audio. Yeah, we, um, you know, as as anyone who lived through it, which is most of us, uh, unless they were, you know, four years old or something like that might remember, uh, a big part of COVID and lockdown was everyone learning how to use Zoom. Um, you know, there was Skype and a few other video conferencing uh, programs and Microsoft Teams, I think, was, was in existence. But really, we all got really into Zoom and we figured out how to use it. And with Comic-Con Begins, uh, we were producing with SiriusXM and Stitcher. Uh, so we had a really great production team there. Um, I had some technical know-how when it comes to that kind of thing, but it was really great working with these pros who were doing all the biggest podcasts uh, out there. And uh, they really helped us to use the Zoom interviews that we were doing for the most part. Uh, but yeah, the, the podcast was audio. We do have the recordings of the interviews that we did with everyone over Zoom, and some of them are quite clear. So we're, we're deciding now if we're going to be using any of that, uh, that, that material. And we also have other video interviews that we've done over the years since then, um, as well as Pamela Jackson over at San Diego State University and her team uh, with a project called Comic-Con Kids, which is great and is available online free through her website, through the San Diego State University website. They had all these fantastic interviews going, uh, I think, back in 2011 or 2012 that they allowed us to use as well. So really, we're gathering as much material as we can. And certainly, uh, because everyone like Scott and, and about the 50 or so other folks that we interviewed for this project uh, have been so supportive since day one, um, you know, interviewing them or using interviews we've done with them in the past is not going to be that difficult. And we'll probably be getting you know, new interviews with them and new interviews with other people as well. But again, the, the biggest thing, especially in this day and age, is all the streamers, all the studios, all the big uh, you know, players in the documentary game now are, are asking, where's the archive? Where's the stuff from the past? And that's really what we needed. Uh, and it just was difficult because, as Scott could tell you, um, you know, they didn't know that this was going to become what it became you know, back in 1970, 1971. So there, and plus, you know, that equipment didn't exist. Everyone didn't have cell phones. Just having, you know, video cameras, or even film cameras was very difficult or even just regular cameras itself. Um, so there's not a lot of visual audio material from the early days of Comic-Con that exists. Um, what little does exist, we've been able to use for different things. Like Mike Towery has a great website of audio material as well. But this is the first time that a team like ours has actual video material in 15 hours of it, of panels, of shows, of interviews, celebrities, all different kinds of things. Um, and uh, it really puts you back there. It's it's like a it's like a time machine. Um, for me, it's been great because I've been hearing about these different things going on and these people, and these characters from the scene that are either gone now or I never got a chance to meet. Now I actually get to see them and it, it works out uh, really amazingly. Like I, I can tell who some of the people are without having to have them identified. Like that's clearly Gabriel Wisdom, who was a radio personality who really helped San Diego Comic-Con get going back in the day and dressed up like Thor. And, you know, when I see a guy like that in the videos, I know that that's Gabriel Wisdom. So um, it's it's been really exciting for me hearing about all these stories for so long. Um, and uh, yeah, and for someone like Scott, you know, I've, I've, I had an opportunity to send him some of the stills and things. I mean, it must be really fun for you as well just to see these things for the first time since they happened. There was material that was uh, filmed in, uh, back in, I don't know, in the early 80s that uh, was kind of looking back on people that had, you know, cartoonists that had, had passed during the time. And I remember when I, they, they showed it on a closed circuit in one of the hotels in downtown San Diego. And I remember just crying like a baby watching it. And so one thing I've been wanting to see ever, ever since then. And of course, now that I'm old, I really will be crying like, like an old man. But, um, you know, it's, you know, seeing stuff like that. I mean, from an outsider point of view, I'm sure that it's interesting. But seeing portions of my life when I was young and excited about everything and and we didn't I, as, as we keep saying we didn't know what we were really creating and frankly a lot of us didn't take any photos or movies because we were too busy having fun sure <laughs> absolutely you know really scott um mentioning too the the uh 
seeing some of the creators that aren't with us anymore. I what was your first? Oh my God! I can't believe so and so is here at Comic Con when it was as small as it initially was. Well, it's interesting because the two biggest stars were people, and that I loved seeing being around. But I'd already met both of them due to being in fandom. We met Jack Kirby at his home, and I don't know when it was. It was before the show, and. Uh, then we all came out as characters in Jimmy. A lot of us, six of us, came in were characters in Jimmy Olsen about six months after that. So that was after the very first one in wow. March, 1970. But the other guy was Ray Bradbury, who yes. was at a science fiction convention. And uh, Greg Bear and David Clark and John Pound and I, we'd drive up to L.A. and have lunch with him. Wow. And I realize now from the other point of view that he liked hanging out with us because we reminded him of when he and all of his pals that were yearning to do this and maybe he's kind of had a, a toe into it, but not really full blown professionals yet. And, uh, you know, being in the same profession, I'm very glad to be in it, but I'm not as nearly as excited as I was when I was in my early twenties, you know? Well, yeah. And again, it's unfortunate the way the, the show has uh, changed given how organic it originally was when your group, you know, got together. I mean, in that Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland sort of, hey, kids, let's put on a show. Yeah, because only a few of us had ever even attended a fan convention before. And uh, that, I, I know that, that Shell Dorf was uh, involved with the one in Detroit, but the rest of us had gone to one in 1968 at the World Science Fiction Con Convention in Berkeley, California. And it, you know, obviously it was seeing, you know, old men, quote unquote, old men, our dad's age, dressing up, looking like weirdos. <laughs> but, but, you know, seeing guys kissing each other, seeing people smoking pot. I mean, it was like a cultural, you know, landslide all at once to see all that happen. Wow. And, uh, uh, you know, we'll never see that show again. But, uh, it was unique in and of itself, but obviously an incredibly great way to find out what fandom was like. You know, I want to show some of these pictures that uh, Matthew shared with me. And uh, here are the first one. There we go. Now, is that Sergio? Yeah, I can tell from the drawings it's Sergio. Right, Sergio Aragonas? Certainly. Yeah. No, and this, again, this is coming. These are stills. Uh, and, and John, I got to say you and, and your viewers, those who are watching and, uh, you know, those who are listening can hear us maybe describe them. Uh, these are stills that have not been seen, uh, since they were actually taken. And these are stills from the video archive, uh, mm -hmm. that we've been able to, uh, utilize and, and have a deal with the, the owner of, um, as I said, we had to transfer the, the video files uh, that were on this very strange, obscure format. Um, many of the tapes were somewhat damaged and such too, so we had to have them cleaned. It was a process that took actually a few months. Um, in fact, we, we knew about this for a while, but we didn't want to announce anything until we were certain. We didn't even know if, if the tapes would work at all. We didn't know what was on there. Even the person who owned them, um, he wasn't sure, you know, what exactly was on there as well. Uh, so we're, we're very excited. And, and these are the kinds of stills, uh, from, from the video footage that we have. And, that right there was Sergio Aragones, who I'm sure anyone listening or watching this knows who he is, but he's definitely been a big part of Comic-Con uh, since the early days, is one of the you know uh, early Mad Magazine artists who created the Marginals, and uh, he, he created Gru the Wanderer and does that with people like Mark Evanier and uh, you know people like Scott, who could probably describe him much better than I, because uh, you actually know him much, more, much better than I do, of course. Uh, you know They look up to him like a mentor and something of an idol. I mean, everyone I talked to said Sergio was was the guy. I mean, he really, to probably many, he's the great living legend right now um, of cartooning. And uh, the few times I've had an opportunity to talk with him, uh, you know, has been fantastic. Plus he's got a great accent and a great voice. <laughs> yeah, I kind of consider him to be the ambassador of cartoonists because he's got that natural charisma. He's not putting on anything. He's always been himself. And uh, he hasn't attended any shows for, for a few years due to the COVID and his family wanting to keep him safe and healthy. But, uh, you know, I think he's respected in every country in the world because due to being drawing pantomime on top of doing the stuff with Mark, 
it's, it's usable in every country. Absolutely. I, I never heard uh, the phrase marginals, but obviously you're talking about those little drawings in the, in the borders of man's pages and stuff. Well, he also does a four, four pay, or at least until Mad more or less went in no, nothing but reprints. He'd do like a four, sometimes six page article that was all Pan Mime as well. His, uh, he, uh, DC got him to do one of those solo books, Mark Torello yeah. uh, curated all those great, like, artist spotlight things. And the stories that he told about meeting Marty Feldman, uh, sadly, on his last movie, Yellowbeard. And and literally like met him and the next day Marty died of a heart attack, um, and he and he has a I mean it's sad but also funny and of course in his story he's like I killed Marty Feldman because he was dressed he was an extra and he was dressed as a policeman and uh, Feldman thought he was a real policeman and kind of freaked out and you know poor Sergio in his broken English said no 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 I'm I'm not a I'm just playing a policeman I'm not really a policeman he's a he's fantastic I met him at WonderCon good lord fifteen years ago. And we really got to hang out. It was Sunday night after WonderCon was done. And it was him and Chance the Kai and uh, a few other people that I'm, I'm friends with. Uh, Jet Thorne, uh, a, good, uh, a good artist as well. So it was just so great. And yeah, man, we just all sat at Sergio and Stan's feet. Let them tell stories. So uh, is, is Sergio one of the people that you uh, were able to interview for the new uh, documentary? Yeah, so we, um, we did uh, interview him for the podcast and then use that material for the book as well. Um, and, um, you know, depending on, as Scott said, his health. So we, we, he's one of the people we actually don't have a video interview for. Um, but of course he's also just because he is who he is, there's plenty of, um, material and, and interviews with him from the past. And a lot of what my job has been over this period, you know, as I was saying before, where we got a lot of great video interviews that we were able to use for the podcast, the book from Pamela Jackson over at San Diego State University has been um, working with other people like the, the person we got the archive from, for example, for the documentary um, and other organizations around the country. So since I've been traveling around a lot and touring and, and speaking about Comic-Con and working with people like Scott and other people in different places, because everyone's kind of spread out now, you know, Barry Alfonso in Pittsburgh and people in New York and, 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 you know, some of the Fanographics team themselves in Seattle with people like Roberta Gregory and Donna Barr and other people like that. Astrid Anderson came out for that one. Um, Greg Bear's uh, uh, widow. Um, and uh, so I've been able to kind of make these really great connections with different colleges and libraries and museums who are, are kind of really becoming part of the team here. Um, and so uh, I, we don't have any video interview of Sergio at the moment, but we'll probably get some uh, depending on his interest of, of part participation. Uh, quite literally, John, and, and Scott knows this too, um, even a lot of the people who we've worked with on the book project and podcast um, are not aware that we have finally, you know, locked down getting the, the documentary going. So we still have a lot of phone calls and emails and such to make, and I know a lot of them will be very excited. We have a core team of about 10 people uh, of Scott's kind of level who were there at the very beginning, um, and a few other people who were very involved with Comic-Con um, who we, we have discussed with and who are coming on as a Scott, as a consultant. Um, and we'll probably work out some other credits with him as well. There's been some discussion about having Scott and a few other people maybe do some original animation for this. Oh, um, then great. Yeah. yeah, we really want this kind of like the way the podcast was in the book. We really want people like Scott and some of the subjects to have a lot of agency over what this is and how this works. Nothing is worse than a, than a, um, a documentary that comes out where you can tell, you know, the subjects were just interviewed and then kind of just thrown away and, and there's a lot of misinformation and, and you don't really get that personal sense um, that you get with something like this. Like I, I've been telling everyone since day one and we've always talked about eventually a movie since the very start of this. Um, but I keep saying, you know, this this is your guys' story. This is your stories. I'm just the one who's, you know, facilitating putting it together um, through just connections I've had over the years and the fact that I've done my books and with other subjects and things like that. My friend who happened to be at Sirius XM, who said, hey, you want to do a podcast with us? And we, we did the podcast and that led to the book. And um, so but this is, this is you know, Scott's story. This is, you know, people like, you know, Mike Towery's story and Sergio's story and Mark Evanier's story um, and, you know, Trina Robbins' story. I mean, this is their, their, their project, their stories. I'm just kind of facilitating it. Um, and so we really want them to have a lot of ownership over it, you know, and you'll, you'll, you'll feel that as I think, and I hope you do with the podcast and the book, you really get a sense. This is their personal stories that's being told and not some kind of funneled, you know, corporate, you know, biased piece or something like that, or 
talking about politics or talking about, you know, this, that, or the other. Like, we really want it to be the personal memories and stories of these people, some of whom, unfortunately, aren't with us anymore, even since we started this project, like Greg Bear, unfortunately, or Gene Henderson, some of whom have, you know, gone through some scares with medical, you know, scares, like, you know, just Trina Robbins recently, people probably know, um, you know, she, she's been having some medical issues lately. Luckily, it sounds like she's doing better, thank goodness, uh, but has been a big part of our project. Um, so we really want to make sure that we're getting these stories out there, Studs Terkel style, Alan Lomax style. I've been mentioning them since day one. And, you know, real oral histories. That's even how the book is, for those who don't know. It's not me writing a book with these people's interviews. It's literally their little snippets of stories that I kind of put together as a narrative, but more as an editor than as a writer. And the great thing about all this is none of us agree on anything. <laughs> We all see it Rashomon style. Sure. And that's what I love. And and with very few exceptions, none of us are upset with anybody else. We all understand that then and now. A lot of people have made comments about how could how could you be living it up the way you were if you were on the committee? Well, I was the publicist. I was the guy doing the posters and the badges and stuff. My job was done when Comic Con came along. That wasn't my idea. That's just what I do, right? <laughs> so, you know, I got to got to enjoy life like everybody else, rather than having to be worried about I don't want looking around, make sure that I wasn't goofing off. You know? So much of your early poster art is in See You in San Diego, and I'm I'm certain that obviously in the film documentary we'll see a lot of that as well, Scott. It's it's so great. And again, that era of, um, you know, I, I always say, uh, and, and since uh, Matthew made me aware of the, the project, uh, that you guys really were, and I'm not saying this to be nice, it's that outlaw thing that was happening in music and film at the same time. And you guys were the cartoonists, uh, you know, basically doing the same thing. You had something in your hands, Scott. Did you want to show us? Uh... Well, I was just going to say, I also, I've got a new book. This is just the Oh, great. But I've got a new book, and in it, I've got a lot of that early stuff from Comic-Con. Cool. So if anybody finds interest in it. This well, is Scott, you're gonna, we're going to have to come back and do it. On if anybody's interested. I was going to say. Awesome, awesome, yeah. awesome book. Everyone should get a copy of it. It's really well, cool. and, and, Scott, let's absolutely do a, another word balloon and, and talk about the book, please. Certainly. If you're willing. You know, okay. I don't mean to put you in, on the spot here, but, you know. That'd be I'm great. About this giant globe that's affixed itself to my head in the corner here. <laughs> it, hurts, it hurts so bad. Oh. John, John, if I may, actually, you brought up something I think that's really important, and Scott was kind of showing you some examples there, and, and that's a lot of what you see in his book. Um, he even just sent me something um, that was that was some art, old artwork that, as he does sometimes, that, that's never been published at all, and it's just a really great piece. So it's you know, and another exciting thing for me as a fan just to like see his stuff. Um, but uh, I was talking just the other day with uh, a woman I've become friendly with named Trisha Romano, who just came out with an oral history of Village Voice, the Village Voice magazine. And it's like like the Comic-Con oral history. Um, it really is very personal. She spoke to everybody, people who were already on, like Norman Mailer and a few others, of course. Fight for um, she was able to acquire and license some interviews and such with them. So it really is everybody going all the way back to the 1950s through today and all the ups and downs of the village voice. And we were actually talking about this a little bit. Um, when you do oral histories like this or the kinds of books I do, you become friendly with a lot of these other authors and such as I am. Um, but you know, the first thing she said when I mentioned the Comic-Con oral history, uh, as unfortunately some people do is, oh, I'm not really that into comics. And I had to tell her, no, 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 just like, then she did the same thing with her village voice uh, oral history. Which, by the way, people should check out. It just came out also. It's called The Freaks Came Out to Write. Literally just came out. I think you know, <laughs> fantastic. Um, she's a media person, though, much more than I am, though. So she's all over the New York Times and everything. So that's great for her. But, um, you know, it's not just about the village. Voice. It's about what was going on in the culture at the time and all these different aspects of what was happening in the 1950s and war and racism and sexism and feminism and you know, why Jules Pfeiffer's cartoons were so important, the way that music changed and punk rock and rock and roll and hip hop. And that's, and I was explaining to her, that's a lot of what we did with the Comic-Con oral history, see you at San Diego in the podcast, is it's not just about comics, which 
as anybody who knows anything about Comic-Con knows, that's not what Comic-Con is anyway. It's not just comics. It's animation. It's movies. Back in the day, it was magic, yo-yos. It was, it's everything. It's all of pop culture. It's all of fandom. That's what's so great about it. But the book, the podcast, and now the movie is really about so much of what's going on and so much of the artwork that you see with people like Scott Shaw or, again, someone like Trina Robbins or even, obviously, Sergio with his Mad Magazine stuff and other things. You're seeing people talking about Vietnam. You're seeing people talking about Kennedy. You're seeing people talking about in stories or short stories or artwork, you know, what's going on with the space age, what's going on with music and punk rock. And Scott even has some really great artwork over the years, which is how fashion changed, you know, or people growing up and going from being these teenage fans to suddenly their parents and then grandparents. And you're seeing a lot about not just Comic-Con and not just comics and science fiction and fantasy, but San Diego, California, the country, the world, you were talking before about Stan Sakai. He's another person who's worked closely with us. And he talks about the influx of anime. He talks about the influx of all this artwork coming in from other countries and other places, as does Sergio's. Artwork coming in from Mexico, artwork coming in from New Zealand, from Australia, from England. What they were doing over it with Heavy Metal Magazine and, and you know Mobius and people like that. Um, but really, it's about all of culture itself. I've said this before. I'm not the person who came up with the idea. But someone, I can't remember who made the point, we don't even need to call it pop culture anymore. We can just call it culture. And that's why we focused on Comic-Con and people like Scott and his stories because he was there at the nexus of it. You know, Comic-Con was this hub where so many different people were coming from so many different backgrounds and races and religions and at a point ages and genders and countries and, and they were bringing so many different things together and it created what Comic-Con has become today. And that's really what the story is. Well, we also have to also uh, acknowledge the fact that just like that uh, Baycon show I went to in 68, in 1970, things hadn't changed much except even progressed wilder. It was a m massive change in culture at the time. And uh, uh, a lot of us were, uh, you know, smoking pot and taking LSD. There was sex in the pool. I mean, a lot of things that we've been criticized for admitting, but it wasn't like we were doing that at Comic-Con. That's what was going on outside, too, with people our age. That's exactly what we were doing and looking forward to it every time. Yeah, I so hear you, Scott. And honestly, um, I'm saying this, everybody. I, I The video people can see that I'm saying it, but I just want to be clear for the audio people. Um, I don't understand the rejection, my word, from the Comic-Con uh, organization currently with what you guys have been trying to do, that they almost seem embarrassed because of that rock and roll lifestyle that, like you said, was everywhere. And um, why not uh, point out that, if anything, I think it shows that you guys were part of what was happening. And and and, and uh, for all the uh, for all the uh, positives and negatives, and that's that's good. And and as as Matthew just said, that was what culture was at that moment when you guys were making Comic Con. Yeah, I I really don't like seeing anything getting scrubbed so clean that it's perfect by somebody's yeah. standards, but not mine. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, you know, we, we, we actually talk about this a little bit uh, in the back pages of the book. And, and I've talked about this with some interviews. John, you even had us on the show to talk about this. And it came up even when I was at the last Comic-Con where we were promoting the book at the Fanographics table. Um, and, you know, ironically, for good or ill, uh, you know, I don't want to burn too many bridges or say anything too negative. Um, but some of the, um, you know, I, I don't know if I would call it rejection, but definitely some of the dismissal of what it is that we've been doing. And again, this isn't just me. This is Scott and the many people who have been working with us on these projects, including people who remain very friendly and close with a lot of the folks who run Comic-Con now. And for those who don't know, you know, the reality is the people who run Comic-Con now, you know, Comic-Con International, are not the same people who created Comic-Con from back in the day. Um, in fact, you know, even people like Faye Desmond, who was there from, you know, a little earlier on, she wasn't there from day one, but was there from earlier on, you know, she's, she's more or less stepped away and John Rogers is no longer with us. And so the board that runs it now, you know, without saying too, anything too negative about them again, as I say, it's just, it's not the same group of people. And of course, you know, what's going to happen is there's going to be different mission goals and different needs and different wants and different responsibilities, which I appreciate and understand. Um, but it, it has been, uh, 
disappointing and at times frustrating um, that they haven't been more helpful or more supportive of what we've been doing. Because really what we're doing is trying to tell their story. And the reality is, and a lot of people are wondering about this, you know, they haven't really done it. They haven't really been doing it. You know, people even wonder with the Comic-Con Museum, why isn't there more about Comic-Con itself? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of speculation, and there's a lot of rumors, and there's a lot of reasons why, you know, some people think that that's happening. But the fact is, is they're not doing it, or at least they haven't been doing it to the extent that we've been doing it. And as I said, when I was at Comic-Con this last time, we sold out of the books, and a lot of people were talking about the books because they heard us talking about this on your show, John, where they oh, saw what Austin was talking about um, in Bleeding Cool. No, we, I mean, we were we were selling more books and selling out more than some of the bigger name books that were at the Fanographics table. I mean, even Gary Groth, our publisher, who's also been great since day one, and he also has some choice words to say about the Comic Con people. Um, you know, uh, you know, was was surprised at that and said, "Wow!" And we realized. You know, as much as they're trying to kind of dismiss what we're doing or ignore it, or if nothing else, just not helping us, um, it's it's getting people to say, hey, we, we should help these guys out. We should be there for them. And that has been happening. We've been having people reach out to us saying, you know, for years, we don't understand why Comic-Con hasn't done a better job of telling its story. Um, and for whatever reason that might be, they're, they're just not doing it. And so here we are doing it. And I would say also, I have all my other books that I've done in oral histories, and some of my favorite oral histories that I've read or seen, you know, it's not official. Um, we never got permission to do this through Comic-Con International. And I agree with Scott, If even if we had, even if we were able to work something out, you know, aside from the fact it would have taken way too long because there would have been so many committee members and this and blah, 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 blah. But also, more importantly, they would have wanted to scrub some things out. And there definitely is a big discussion point that maybe some, one of the reasons why they don't like what we're doing is they don't want to hear about the sex, drugs, and rock and roll aspect of it, which, you know, was a part of it, but not the only part of it, you know, but it is that we need to discuss. These were teenagers in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. You know, we're going to pretend that that was in, in San Diego, California. I mean, hello. They were going up to Berkeley. They were hanging out with underground comics people. Sure. One, of the, one of the one of the things we have in our, in our archival video footage that people have not seen since day one is Timothy Leary, you know, Mr you know, acid guru himself at Comic-Con, you know, right out of getting out of jail, you know, his probation officer was there at a panel with George Clayton Johnson uh, and Theodore Sturgeon, the science fiction writer. I mean, that was happening. That is a part of the story. And to dismiss what we're doing for that or for whatever other reason is just a shame. And all I can say is we hope that there will be a point where we can work with them and, and make this, you know, a more efficient. But if that doesn't happen, we haven't needed their permission to do the podcast or the book. And, you know, we can move forward. I don't want there to be any confrontation or difficulties, but also we don't want to not tell this story. Because as I said, Greg Bear is gone. Gene Henderson is gone. There are people that I would have liked to have gotten, like Charlie Lippincott, who was an early publicist who really got things like Star Wars going on a promotional level, who was a big part of Comic-Con, who had passed away right before I started this. And other people are going to be gone soon, too. And we need to get their stories. We need to get this down so that it's the right story to tell, warts and all, with the good and the bad and everything in between, um, you know, and that's that's such an important part of what we're doing here. We do hope Comic-Con itself will help us out with that, but if not, you know, then we'll just keep going like we've been doing all along. We haven't needed their help until now. We don't need it in the future either. Before we move on, though, I just have to say Comic-Con is still my favorite show by far. It's like going home. I see more friends there. I see kids that... I drew something for back in 1973, bringing their grandkids to have me do drawings for them. I like doing sitting next to Sergio. And uh, in fact, our whole aisle of cartoonists is Steve Leoloa, Bill Morrison, Tom Richmond, uh, Steven Silver. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a wonderful place because we can hang out with our buddies and make money at the same time. Um, I love doing the oddball comic show. I love doing the quick draw show. So it's like, in no way am I slagging Comic Con. I just feel a little disappointed that 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 they don't understand what we're trying to do here. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I I, ha I have to just uh, to to wagon train onto that. Even even with with me with with being feeling sometimes a little persona non grata, like oh, it's the guy who's doing the book and the podcast that. Comic Con might not actually want to happen or whatever. Like I always feel very welcome there. I've had lunch and dinner with some of the Comic Con people, sitting there knowing that they're not exactly pleased with what I'm doing. And Scott's right. Once you're there, Neil deGrasse Tyson actually talks about this in his memoir. 
Neil deGrasse Tyson refers to Comic-Con as the closest thing to utopia that he's ever experienced. <laughs> you know, this is a scientist saying that. So, you know, it's objective. But it, I mean, and other people have said the same thing. And I talk about this even in the back of my book, um, you know, even with, with, with some of these issues that have come up. I still feel when I go to Comic-Con, very welcome. It's so exciting. It gets your blood pumping. And that's that's also why we're doing it. You know, it's like people who might be aware that Walt Disney, you know, had some of his problems and the Disney companies had some of his problems over the years, but they still love Disney. They still love Disney movies. They still love Disneyland, you know, and, and a lot of it becomes about they just want to make it better and they just want to kind of to confront and approach and discuss the goods and the bads and everything because they love it so much. No different than people who maybe even have problems with, you know, American policies or whatnot. It's like, we're still all here. We still love the country, but we also want to be able to critique and talk about and go into the history of what's going on. And that's so much of what we're trying to do with this project, not to get too lofty, but you know, that, that really is what we're doing here is we want everyone's stories to be told. And, you know, especially before people are gone, but I agree with Scott that I have always felt very welcome there. And to meet people like to hang out with them and, and some of these other people that I've gotten to see and, and spend time with, you know, it's been just fantastic. Um, even if, you know, I sometimes might feel, you know, am I, am I wanted here because of the book or the podcast? No, I always feel very welcome there. And I always have a really good good time. And I would recommend it to anybody if you haven't gone to Comic-Con yet. It's well worth going. I, I completely agree. It's been a couple of years since I've been there. But uh, I went many years uh, starting in 06. And I want to say 2018 was probably my last time so it's actually been it's been about six years since i've been there what about this photo who's uh who's this in this photo oh that's a good looking guy in the middle <laughs> wow i wouldn't uh, that's awesome scott because i would not have recognized you with the mustache and the uh the pablo cruz haircut if you will oh that was that was kind of in my era of looking like the meathead on uh, uh <laughs> all the oh, yeah <laughs> yeah except uh Except um, I didn't have to wear a wig like Rob did. But <laughs> that's awesome. Who's flanking you then on the left and right? That, that that's Clayton Moore, who was uh, not one of the early, the earliest people, but uh, joined up pretty soon after that. And he was a, uh, a, a cartoon, a wannabe cartoonist who was pretty good. And uh, he also helped out with the, uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, filming and stuff. So. Uh, yeah, he was an important guy too, and he's on the he's on the cover of the of the uh, book. Oh well, okay. And as you know, I, I'm sure that's not Mike Douglas on the left, but that was the first. I, I think that was one of the guys in the interviewers at, at uh, Channel Ten where we used to go. Oh. They do a lot of publicity for us. Sure, absolutely, man. And uh, all right, this uh... that that's Ken Kruger. Who was okay. never acknowledged as one of the founders until I'd driven people crazy to ad admit he was. But we had three founders, and a lot of people don't understand that because for many years, Shell Dorf was the only person ever mentioned as a founder. But Shell had connections with cartoonists, and that was about it. Um, Richard Alf was the third uh, person involved with creating the show because he had. He was a, a comic book dealer on uh, not online and a mail mail dealer. And sure. He had money to loan us for setting up the first con. He gave us, I think, over two thousand dollars. Wow. Which in 1970 was about four times as much. Sure. And, and Ken had a long, long history in fandom. He attended the very first uh, science fiction uh, convention in. New York City in 1939, first uh, American fan show like that. And uh, over the period of time, he he was a, a wrote for Famous Monsters of Filmland and other magazines. He published lots of books, both uh, science fiction and pornography. And he had over 14 different bookstores around uh, around the the city of San Diego because. He was very good at signing contracts and moving right before the police were going to bust him down. <laughs> and, and it wasn't like that was unique because if you had a small bookstore in those days, that's pretty much how you survived was having a back room with, you know, you know, sunbathing magazines or something. Sure. <laughs> Ken was the opposite of a creepy guy. He was, 
he was really a, a mentor to a lot of us and uh, actually published John Pounds and my first stuff in a comic book he published. That's so he, great, man. Was a great if, if, I, if I may, John, real quick, Ken is one of the ones that I was talking about where I'd heard so much about him from everyone. He was definitely very beloved. Um, un, you know, he's been gone for some time now, but we do have his son, Gus Kruger, who not only has been involved with all the different projects we've done so far, but he's one of the core team members I was talking about who will be working with us as a consultant, just because A, Ken's story is so important. And Gus too, because Gus was there. There's pictures of him and his brother Pete as babies, you know, at Comic-Con back in the day or in the bookstore that Ken ran that a lot of the Comic-Con kids like like Scott and the others kind of hung out at as sort of their CBGBs, which really was sort of the, the cultural hub that became Comic-Con later on. Um, but uh, as I said, I, I had kind of seen some pictures of Ken a little bit. There's not too many of him. Unfortunately, as Scott said, one of the things that we've been doing with our project is kind of illuminating that it wasn't just Sheldorf or, or these other people who were very involved in the early days of Comic-Con, like Richard Alf, and it's certainly Ken Kruger, which Gus, you know, his son really appreciates our giving him that spotlight. Um, but I hadn't seen too much of Ken. So to be watching the videos and listening and such, and again, there's no subtitles and it's a lot of just like mishmash of stuff. Sometimes it's 10 minutes of something and then 15 seconds something. But as soon as I saw Ken, I went, that's clearly Ken Kruger, you know? And for me, someone who never got the, uh, the opportunity to meet him or know him, uh, or certainly not really hear his voice aside from some audio archival stuff, it was just, it was astounding. It was like, it was like the Holy Grail. Like, wow, that there is Ken Kruger. Yeah. And he's wearing the shirt that I would hear, you know, Hawaiian shirts and whatnot. And he's got the cigar, you know, everyone talks about how we always had a cigar. I mean, like that is exactly what everyone described Ken Kruger as, even though he's standing in his hair. And I was like, that's obviously Ken Kruger. And in fact, one of the first things I did when I was going through the footage was I sent that still to Gus and I went, hey, this guy looks a little familiar. And he really appreciated it. Uh, and so that was just so much fun to see Ken and, and to go, look, there there he is. And I'm hearing him talking and I'm watching him talking. And um, it's been one of the great joys of this project for me and going through the archival footage that we have. So uh, that, that's part of what we're doing here is really illuminating those kinds of stories that you might not hear as much about or people like Ken Kruger, whose name's not everybody knows, unfortunately, but they will know after this documentary comes out for sure. That's cool. I got one more photo that you send me. Ah, George Clayton Johnson. George okay, Clayton. in the middle. Yes, now that you say that, of course. Yeah, yeah a Twilight Zone author. Uh, that's Theodore Sturgeon on his left, and that's Tim wow. Fury on the right. Wow. Man, yeah. I... Uh, which, I one, the... which one was stoned the most at this <laughs> <laughs> I met uh, George, I think the last his last Comic-Con, unfortunately... And I and I know I think I told Matthew this as well. Andy Parks, uh, the artist who's a little younger than me, I grabbed him and I'm like, "Listen, upstairs right now in a panel, George Clayton Johnson." He's like, "I've heard that name." I'm like, "He wrote the first episode that they showed of Star Trek. He wrote several great Twilight Zones. He co-wrote Logan's Run." I'm like, "This is a big." He goes, "Oh yeah, we got to meet him." So it was great, and we're like, you know, in our. Uh, I, I think I might have been. I'm trying to do the math. I think I might have been in my early 50s. Uh, he was. Uh, he was in his late 40s. And Johnson was so great to us. And he's like, "Oh, it's really nice to meet you, boys." And we're just dying. We're like, "We're boys. That's fantastic." And he had his. He had his hat. That um, kind of Chinese hat that he used to wear. And I mean, one of the original beatniks. Am I right, Scott? I would say he was the real life Mork because he always struck me as a friendly alien from another planet. And by the way, he received an award at the last San Diego Comic Fest, I think, before he passed. And he's up on stage. Mike Towery ran that show as a kind of a, a imitation of the early days of Comic Con. Sure. A big, big glass trophy. And as he's accepting the award, he re he lights it up. It was actually a giant bong. And Mike was like, if the if the hotel finds out that we're doing this, I'm done. You know, he's really might never get that excited, but I'm sure in his head he was like a circus. <laughs> <from time>. Outstanding, <laughs> that's great, man. No, he. I'm so I'm so glad I got to meet him, and I you know, um, uh, years ago I had Mike Mike uh, J Michael Straczynski on uh, my show, and you know he wrote the '80s Twilight Zone. He wrote a few episodes of that. And I was talking to him about guys like George and Charles Beaumont, of course, Serling, Richard Matheson. 
I mean, that that golden age of sci-fi writers and everything that were so vital in both their prose and also uh, the teleplays and films that they wrote. Pretty amazing. By the way, I once met uh, Rod Ser Serling and asked him if he uh, he and his crew ever read EC Comics. And he said, of course we did. <laughs> <laughs> Had he ever gone to Comic Con? Did Rod ever go to Comic Con? No, no. I I met him when I was in college, and he was doing a tour to apologize for Planet of the Apes, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, what was the other one where he was only the the TV host of the thing? Um, Night Gallery. 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 Yeah, he he yeah. was really upset that only a few of his stories were written, and he was mainly just hired to be the host. Well, you know, I I love, and they're on YouTube. Uh, UCLA has done a wonderful job of keeping their archives when they would have celebrities uh, do big presentations. And there's a couple times that, that Rod did it. Um, and I, and that's why I look forward to your guys' documentary. And one of the reasons why I love uh, the podcast series as well, uh, Comic-Con Begins. And uh, Brink, uh, is Brink going to be involved in the, uh, in the movie as well, Brink Stevens? Yeah, uh, we, we've talked with her, and, and for those who don't know, Brink Stevens, um, again, uh, you know, wasn't necessarily one of the founders, but she was definitely there in the earliest days, and we have some great footage. She had sent me some material she had as well, because she used to do shows um, as part of the Masquerade, um, which was a little bit different in the earliest days, but she really kind of helped to popularize that and kind of became the person who's coordinating a lot of that at a very young age. And that's one of her big contributions to Comic-Con in addition to a lot of the other things that she did. And of course, these days now, she's still working. Anytime I talk to her, uh, I don't want to say how old she is because it's probably impolite, but I mean, it's amazing. Like anytime I talk to her, she's not just making one movie. She's usually shooting like six at the same time. I mean, she is all over the place, all over the country and world making movies, but we, we, we still chat pretty occasionally. And uh, she's aware that we're finally getting the documentary going. And obviously, her coming from the world of, of Hollywood and, and being very involved in a lot of it, um, she's very excited about it. But she she was, the, in addition to being an interviewee for the podcast and the book, and uh, you know some of the other things that she helped us with uh, as a consultant and that kind of thing, she, she was the narrator. Uh, the podcast, we wanted to have kind of some inner, the book is really just straight up oral history. Yes. Uh, but in the podcast, we did want to have some interstitial moments where, we had a person and we, we decided Brink would be great because, you know, she is an actress. She's got a fantastic voice. She was very involved in Comic-Con through the early years, so it made sense to have her on. Plus, she's got some great geek cred. I mean, let's be honest. I'm sure a lot of people listening or watching this right now knows who Brink Stevens is. Um, so we really wanted that to be a big part of this. Um, but, um, yeah, she was she was fantastic from, from day one. Um, and, of course, you know, was, was married and, and very close with Dave Stevens. Um, and was a model for him, obviously, and we've talked a lot about that. So, and Dave Stevens, who uh, obviously I, I didn't get a chance to interview because he was already gone, but you know, he's another one who's one of these great stories that it's so much fun to tell and illuminate and, and spotlight. They just did that great documentary about him, that Brink and, and some of the folks that were in our project is in. I was in, yeah. Of course, yeah. But there's a lot of Dave Stevens in our story, um, and even a period of time where Brink and Dave were kind of like sort of the Ken and Barbie of the Comic-Con world a little bit. Uh, and so, uh, but yeah, no, we're, we're, we're very excited to, to bring Brink on board. Plus her, she's got some great stories and connection to Forrest J. Ackerman, Forrest J. Ackerman. Scott was talking about famous monsters of film land. Um, and that too, and Forrest was, and his, his you know, his, his Ackermansion was such a big inspiration for people like Scott and Brink and all the others. Like he again was sort of doing it early on. We have this great picture in the book of, Forey Ackerman, Ray Bradbury, and Ray Harryhausen all together. And I mean, they basically came up together. I mean, they were some of the original, you know, professional fans. Yeah. And, you know, they, they, they were fans. They, they were that before they were professionals. Right. Yeah. Here in LA. Yeah. So we really are, are going to be able to get a lot more about Forey through, and we have video footage of Forey getting uh, interviewed at Comic Con. And, and more pictures and such. And a lot of what this is about, you know, it might be a little bit late in the game for me to get this out there. Um, and there'll be, you know, there's more press releases and things coming out about this. We'll be talking more about the, the documentary soon enough as well. But, you know, call to action time also. Anyone who's who's been this interested in all this, like, hit us up. I mean, you know, we, we want more archival material. Maybe there are people out there who have some video or some film, 16 millimeter or, 
or uh, whatever it might be around pictures or, or artwork, especially of those early years. Obviously, the last couple decades, that stuff's cake. That stuff's easy. We have more sure. than that. But to get the stuff from the 70s and 80s, um, we have Paul M. Salmon, who wrote the book on uh, back to, on, on the Blade Runner um, and has done so many other things. He was a big part of the publicity for Hollywood at Comic-Con, for good or ill. You know, and he, he talks about both sides. You know, he's part of why Hollywood came to Comic-Con, which was good and bad, you know. And, um, right. But uh, he, he just discovered some great color photos that he has uh, from the 80s at Comic-Con with some big celebrities and such involved that he's going to be letting us use. So anyone who's listening to this or watching this who might have some material um, and, you know, we, as you can see from the book, um, you know, we, we credit everybody and you know, we're, we're happy to talk about, you know, other ways of, of making sure people are happy with us using their material. That's, we want this to be as much stuff as possible, personal material. We really want that in there, sketches or audio or whatever it is. So, what we don't need is somebody holding up a, just taking a photo of a comic that Jack Kirby signed there. We don't, <laughs> not, not that kind of material. Please. Yeah, we have plenty of that. <laughs> I can appreciate that. Yeah. Well, you're, you're right, guys. And, and it's something that I uh, try to do in my own way with Word Balloon uh, that I always say uh, and my crass comment about every, uh, every fart since the 90s is well documented on video and audio. It really is earlier in the 20th century that there are gaps and it's important for people to get the story straight while they still can from the people that were there. And I, and I, uh, God, I, I think of a lot of my podcast brethren that frankly do get it wrong because they're basing their information on third generation stories of things. And it's like, no, it didn't happen that way. And thankfully there are people that are still out there like yourself, Scott, that were there and can set the record straight. I'm really glad that, uh, the movie is moving forward. Yeah, we're, 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 we're very, very interested in what you were just talking about, John. Um, and again, I, I'm, I'm, I don't really like to, to throw people under the bus type of thing, but I just have to say it because it is frustrating. I know it's frustrating to Scott as well. But there was even, you know, a Rolling Stone article just a couple of years ago. I mean, this this is still relatively new. Um, and you can look it up and see, you know, that, that you know, uh, 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 suggests that it was telling the, the origin story of Comic-Con. They, they did talk to Scott and a few other people. But I mean, right in one of the first paragraphs, it says that San Diego and New York are the same thing, which I could see how someone could be confused by that. But when you're doing research, when you're a journalist, when you're doing fact finding, you know, that that, sh that should not be appearing in your article. That And that should definitely be the kind of thing that's getting flagged, you know, through fact checkers or editors. I know, unfortunately, these days there aren't really such things anymore, even at Rolling Stone. But it's Rolling Stone and whatever problems Rolling Stone's had over the last couple of years or whatnot, it's still one of the big mainstream publications. And even people that I've talked to who have been working with us on these kinds of things have brought up that article. And I have to tell them, you know, there's a lot in there that's not right. And that's one of the really big ones. You know, anyone who knows anything about Comic-Con, San Diego Comic-Con knows New York and San Diego are two completely different things, even down to philosophy. San Diego is a nonprofit started by people like Scott. New York is a corporate entity, you know, with Reed Pop and such, and they do a great job and all more power to them. Nice folks and that kind of thing, but it's not the same thing as San Diego. I know that people have pulled folks that Rolling Stone, who got that wrong, they changed that and a few other inaccuracies, and they still have it. It's still up like that. So when people are looking up Comic Con and they're seeing an article like that, or things in Wikipedia, as we all know, you know, you can't trust Wikipedia or things like that. That really is a problem. And, um, you know, we really want to rectify that and remedy it, which is why I hope at a point we can make nice with with, with Comic-Con International work with them because this this behooves them too. Uh, you know, whatever they might not want to be out there, I'm sure they don't want misinformation out there. I'm sure they don't want major publications or books in the future, documentaries in the future, you know, saying that San Diego and New York are the same thing because they so are not. Um, and that, that too is a lot of what we're doing. And we have to get this going sooner than later before there's no one left to say that that's not true. You know what I mean? Because they're all going to be gone. Um, no, I hear you, man. I, I, uh, you know, coming from sports radio, I've seen the demise of uh, sports illustrated right. and that blows my mind because, uh, just like Rolling Stone, it really was the standard as far as sports journalism for decades and it's death by a thousand cuts. Uh, they just, you know, kept dwindling down and giving uh, retirement packages to the, the veterans that knew what they were doing. They'd hire new people that wouldn't uh, pass an English, uh, English course 
yeah. where they write articles, and then they they admitted that they were using AI to generate articles as well, and, and to the point where yeah, now the the magazine is basically defunct. The brand exists, but not not. And I understand the death of magazines, you know, uh, but but you know, there, it should have continued. And there's certainly enough uh, other sports news websites out there that don't have the pedigree of Sports Illustrated, and it should have been able to survive online and stuff. Scott, you come from a generation that never trust the man was kind of the mantra. Am I, am I right? I mean, I'm, I trusted, uh, I trusted both Walter Cronkite and Hunter S. Thompson. There you go, man. Absolutely. <laughs> good, good two ends of the spectrum right there too. Absolutely. Yeah, but, uh, I, did. I like both of them equally. But yeah, it's, I mean, I, I do find it a shame that these institutions that we relied on, are, are not what they were and 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 it's it's puzzling i mean i'm really glad you brought that up matthew regarding rolling stone because uh like i said i mean i've i've been tearing my hair out regarding uh sports illustrated it's insane no i i i had some friends there and one of them even just did an interview with me um just less than a year ago about the intersection between nickelodeon and um and the nfl because i'd also done earlier on an oral history of nickelodeon which again, the same kind of thing. I mean, um, you know, there really weren't any real histories of Nickelodeon at the time when I did my book Slimed about 10 years ago now. And, you know, I have people still hit me up about questions and I know people have used it for their PhD theses on, you know, children's television or other things like that. These days you could do a PhD probably just on Nickelodeon, you can do a PhD on anything these days. Um, but, you know, it's very important for me to get that out there and that's why, um, you know, we did we did this as an oral history and are continuing to do this as an oral history. As Scott said, I want there to be contradictions. I want everyone to have their say. I want there to be, you know, what was real, what wasn't the memories. I want there, and also that creates a little bit of interaction for the audience. That creates a little bit of an engagement for the audience. You know, who is telling the truth? Who's right? Who's wrong? You know, who seems a little bit crazier than the others? You know, one person might say something and then three different people say, no, that's not how it happened or, oh, you can't trust so-and-so whatnot. And what's great about this too, along with that is also, I can, I can confirm what Scott said. You know, when I'm talking with these people, it's like talking with a group of high school or college kids who are all having a reunion every time we get together, every time we talk. A lot of them have described Comic-Con that way. You know, there are people who live in other countries now or places way away from San Diego who, they feel like Comic Con is is the only way they get to see some of their old friends from 40 years ago, 50 years ago, um, and it's been great to kind of help you know with, with with keeping that going through the work that I've been doing and reintroducing some people who hadn't talked with each other in a long time and that sort of thing. So um, you know, this is a group of friends. This is a group of people who all helped make this thing happen. Some there since the earliest days. Some there you know, within the last couple of decades. But all people who really made it what it is. And so, yeah, they're going to have different memories and they're going to have different feelings about things. But I want that all in there so that the audience can get what I believe is the truest form of a story and narrative. And that's the personal first person story that's not coming from me, that's com coming from them. And I'm just working kind of as a curator or editor, if you will. I even, you know, with these kinds of projects, I, I kind of bulk at the idea of taking, you know, name of writer or whatnot, because it's not me writing. It's just me kind of editing it, you know, together. Uh, and putting the interviews together and that kind of thing. So that's why I do think what we're doing is very important, especially because, again, it's not just about Comic-Con. It's about pop culture. It's about culture. You know, there are people talking about, again, Vietnam and Woodstock and David Bowie and rock and roll and the free speech movement and personal computers and video games. This is all happening when they were creating Comic-Con. Um, and so you're getting those personal stories of how those things impacted them and how they injected that into what Comic-Con became and what it is, which again is maybe part of why Comic-Con International doesn't want to, you know, hear some of this or see some of that because uh, they want to kind of divorce themselves from some of that larger cultural discussion. But sorry, that's part of what this is about. It's why we tell stories. It's why so many of the comic books are what they are uh, and the movies are what they are, especially during that time. You couldn't avoid it. So, you know, that that's, that's a big part of what we're trying to show and do. And now we're able to do that with the documentary, which is going to be a lot of fun. Sounds great, man. Very excited for it. Uh, I know this is the beginnings of that, so you'll keep us posted. And uh, Scott, throw your uh, throw your book up again, that uh, and we'll we'll show the video audience once again. There it is. Uh, there we go. Yeah, the actual book doesn't have the stripe across the cover, but there you go. 
That's you fun. Put it on there, though. <laughs> Scott Shaw's comics and stories. Everybody who yeah. published that, Scott. Uh, about about books. No, it's called about comics, but it, it it's on. Uh, we did it through Amazon. Oh, that's great, man. Yeah. Oh, very cool. You know, um, excellent. Yeah, I've got so another thing that's on a site called uh, Aces Weekly. That's a twenty-one page story about home nursing. So Aces Weekly. That's uh, David Lloyd's David yeah. Lloyd's comic uh, check, book platform. Check it out. It's all about my experiences with nurses after losing my foot. So it's a little different oh, yeah. from what you expect. Yeah, geez. All right. Yeah, I, I can appreciate that. Wow. Uh, no, hey man, great, great seeing both of you. Uh, continued success. Good luck with. Uh, both the uh, the documentary and Scott, your books, and I don't know Matthew. I'm sure you've got another book along the way. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know you do. But you uh, you mentioned it uh, last time we talked. You're putting together. Yeah, the we're still a little ways off, just because I'm I'm working with the University Press on my next one, so things move a little bit slower. But uh, it's it's Lloyd Kaufman interviews um, one of my other pet projects uh, for a while now. And we might actually be able to have a very similar uh, conversation here sooner than later uh, about Lloyd and Shoma, um, hint, hint. But uh, uh, Lloyd's been a longtime friend of mine. He's also part of our Comic-Con stories. Um, and we've got some great pictures. Lloyd got us pictures of him with people like, uh, you know, obviously James Gunn, who was a, a protege of his, and um, people like uh, uh, John Landis, you know, American Werewolf in London and all those kinds of movies. Uh, because Lloyd's been there with Comic Con since the earlier days too, probably at least the you know the early mid '80s. Um, so he's a big part of our story. But I was able to put together a book of interviews with him for University Press of Mississippi. That'll be coming out, I think, in February of this next year. Uh, and then also around the same time, I'm working with Fanographics again. As I said, I've become very close with a lot of the Comic Con people, and I actually became very good friends with Rick Geary, um, who, among other things, has been involved with Comic Con since earlier on but also did their first real logo, the Toucan, and has worked with them on some other logos and things like that over the years. But he illustrated um, a novella of mine from many years ago, this really weird experimental thing. I don't even have time to explain it, but it's called uh, Daisy Goes to the Moon. Um, it's done, Rick finished it up. The artwork is stunning. Anyone who knows Rick Geary's work uh, knows how great that stuff looks. His pencil sketches look as good as anything finished. We could have, like his sketches, we could have published and people wouldn't have minded. I mean, his stuff is so amazing, so elaborate and beautiful. Um, so Daisy Goes to the Moon, that's going to be coming out with uh, me and Rick Geary, also through Fanographics, probably also in February. <laughs> um, so I'll have those two books coming out. A few other projects coming out. People can look up what I've got going on, including those projects. Or if you want to contact me about what we're doing with the documentary, just www.matthewclickstein.com, Matthew with one T. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll definitely keep you and your audience apprised of what's happening, John. You know, you really, you're one of the first people that we're talking to about this project. Um, you're one of the first, you know, people that have these stills from the video archives. So we always love to come in and talk with you. You've been so great with us in the past. Means a lot, man. No, I feel the same way, both of you guys. And I thank you for being on today. And I thank everybody for watching and listening. Until next time, stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy. Mm -hmm.